Hello, Chart Watchers, and welcome to this Wednesday, May 30th, Market Watchers Live Show with your host, Tom Boley and Aaron Swinlin. For those of you joining us for the first time today, welcome to the show. You picked a great one. And for our regulars, welcome back. Well, one day after the market took a tumble with uh, the political uncertainty in Italy and Spain, we see the market recovering much of those losses. You can see the Dow Jones Industrial Average currently up 270 points. The S&P 500 all the way back filling the gap from yesterday's uh, open lower, uh, currently up 33 points. The NASDAQ actually breaking out of a flag formation. You can see the uh, advance in the first half of May. The last couple of weeks, we've been sideways consolidating, trying to make that breakout today on the NASDAQ. Russell 2000 breaking to another all-time high. We continue to see uh, excellent uh, relative strength in small caps. Ten-year Treasury yield took a tumble yesterday all the way down to 2.76%. Uh, we ba are back up nine basis points today, getting back more than half of that loss, uh, back at 2.86%. Volatility index, which shot through the roof yesterday, pulling back rather substantially, did it today down more than two points to 14.93. Energy bouncing as well. Crude oil, we'll talk about this in a bit, but crude oil bounced off a $66 barrel. And as a result, we are seeing renewed strength in energy. Financials, after getting hit hard yesterday with the drop in treasury yields, also rebounding today with that bounce in treasury yields. Healthcare performing well, nearing a, a breakout here, uh, not too far from a two-month high. We'll see whether or not we can continue that strength. Part of the reason, biotechs. We'll take a look at biotechs as well, but the biotechs trying to make a breakout. Seasonality favors this group as we head into the summer months. Life insurance companies really took a, uh, a beating yesterday with the 10-year treasury yield dropping, but we did hold on to the early May support getting a nice push back to the upside in the life insurance companies. And then finally, wanted to mention the game wasn't huge, but software trying to make a breakout within the technology sector. And with that, let me bring in my co-host, Aaron. Aaron, how are you doing this Wednesday? I'm doing quite well, thank you. It's rather cold here, though. I can barely see the mountains. I've got so much fog on them. It should be an interesting day. I suspect it'll burn off and, and we'll get back to 72 <laughs> we'll yeah, I've got a. I'm going to have an interesting evening because it's Game Two of the Stanley Cup Finals, and my Washington Caps need a win tonight. Yes, that's right. I uh, will be watching. Uh, I I really don't have a horse in that race uh, since the Ducks left, but uh, it, for me, either way is a win because Vegas is Western Conference, which of course is my conference, and you know I'll be happy for you if the Caps win. So. Well, I'll be happy for Alex Ovechkin because uh, he has had quite a playoffs, uh, a playoff run this year. And I know he's taken a lot of heat over the years for not really showing up in some of the biggest series, especially against Crosby and the Penguins. But anyway, <laughs> uh, yeah, it should be a good game tonight. We had It was a great game one on uh, Monday night. So absolutely. Uh, hopefully we'll come out on the better end of that. Uh, but let's keep moving. We do have Mark Chaikin with us today. Uh, we had a great session with Mark, I don't know, a few months back. A lot of volatility has transpired since he was with us, so I'm really interested to get his comments today. But how are you doing today, Mark? I'm great, Tom and Aaron. Uh, I guess we were celebrating the Eagles' victory last time was February 28th that I was yes. on, and now we're on the sidelines. So uh, good luck to the uh, to the hockey buffs. <laughs> but uh, I've, I've just gotten back from Italy, and I'll give everybody an advance look. I went away bullish, and uh, I remain bullish having – uh, just gotten back. Yeah, we were just talking a few minutes ago before the show started, and I was uh, trying to pin some blame on Mark for, uh, I don't know what he did over in Italy, but it created havoc in the global markets. <laughs> I obviously didn't spend enough money, <laughs> although you'd never know it from my uh, credit card bill. Yeah, that's what it is. Well, we're going to have uh, we're going to have you back here in about 10 minutes or so, Mark. So stick around. Uh, he's got a great presentation for everybody today and he'll go into some of the reasons why he remains bullish the market. Uh, but first, uh, I know, Aaron, we've got some uh, some things to talk about in terms of our schedule and the agenda. So I'm going to let you take it away. Absolutely. So for this week, we still have left, and it's been such an exciting week already, just two days in. Tomorrow, Tom, you're going to be doing the seasonality report for June, and then I'm going to be doing a monthly decision point report. I'll be going over all those monthly charts that have just gone final. And then on Tuesday of next week, oh, it is my turn. I'm going to be doing a workshop. Have obviously not thought about the subject, so you're welcome to 
bring in and suggest in the survey what you might want me to talk about. And then finally, we have Wednesday, Charlie Kirkpatrick is going to be back with us. Uh, he was He's an, uh, a very popular author right now, and I, I suspect you'll be very interested in what he has to say. But for today's agenda, as we were saying, Mark Chaikin is going to do a really great presentation. 10 and 10, our first symbol is going to be Constellation Brands, STZ. And then we're going to finish up today with uh, the scooter report. So we'll see which ones relatively, which stocks are doing the best. And now, Tom, I know we have some interesting technical news and headlines for you to go over. And so let's get to it. Sounds good. All right. We've got uh, the 10 year treasury yield. It's uh, crazy what it, uh, the difference a day can make. Yesterday, uh, all the money was rotating, or a lot of money rotating towards safety. And of course, the 10 year treasury yield, all the treasury bonds uh, saw their fair share, more than their fair share of money rotating in. Uh, and that sent many of the bond prices uh, skyrocketing. And as a result, the yield, which moves inversely to treasury prices, you can see really tumbled yesterday. It was the worst day for the treasury yield, best day for bonds, but the worst day for the treasury yield in 2018. Huge move down. But let's not uh, forget the move that we have seen. We started the year with uh, the treasury yield, the 10 year treasury yield at 2.40. We ran up over 3%, got up to 311. Yes, this has been a very steep drop, but I think in the context, the big picture, we still remain in an uptrend. I'm watching the low that was established back at the beginning of April. Uh, that, I think, would start to turn heads if we were to see the 10-year Treasury yield dip back and close back below 270 in the near term. Uh, I'm not quite sure what that might do, but with all the selling or with all the, the movement to the downside in the Treasury yield, we did see a lot of selling in the financial space over the past five, six, seven trading days. Today, however, we are getting a bounce in the yield, big sell-off in treasuries. And as a result, you can see the yield gapped back up. We went from 293 down to 277 or so on the close yesterday. We have erased more than half of those uh, the losses on that 10-year treasury yield today. And you can see most of it was a gap up at the open. So just like that, a lot of things were reversed. And there were many areas of the market that uh, have benefited as well from a jump in the treasury yields, the, the, the biggest probably the financial stocks. You can see that the XLF, which is the financial ETF, went down, challenged really significant short to intermediate term lows that we've seen throughout this uh, the volatility uh, that started back in late January, early February. The XLF had moved down. We had not seen an open or a close below 26.75. But notice yesterday's low, we did go just beneath that level, only to come back up into the close and hold above it. Today, we gap back up. So far, so good in terms of holding that key support. Uh, the XLE, crude oil prices got down to $66 and change per barrel. And uh, the XLE, as a result, you can see energy shares under pressure for about a week. But today, there's a big bounce back. Crude oil prices were up nicely earlier. I'm not, I haven't looked in a couple of hours. I know they were back up over $67 a barrel. But if we look at the price of crude oil, you'll see that yesterday we got down just below $66 on an intraday basis. And I think I pulled up a chart and annotated this yesterday. But $66 is an area I'm watching pretty closely. I think if you look across at this double top, actually triple top, from January, early February, and again in March, right around $66. We broke above that in the second week of April, and we have not gone back down and closed below it yesterday. Today, or excuse me, yesterday we did move below intraday, but came back up and closed at 66.73. And like I said earlier, I know we were bouncing, I'm sure with the way the XLE is trading, uh, probably we've moved higher on the crude oil price, but uh, that was over $67. So we are bouncing at least short term from a key support level. Uh, looking at the Dow Jones, the two uh, top performers today, as you might imagine, ExxonMobil, XOM, big move here, went back down into this gap support zone, got close to the 50-day moving average, up 3.5% on this oil giant. And uh, ExxonMobil looking now to maybe clear that 82.5 level, which would set it up for possibly a test of the early February high above $87. That will be something to watch. CVX also uh, doing very well today, Chevron. Went all the way down, got a 50-day test, 
and is bouncing up 2.87%. But these have been the two best performers. I do want to mention Boeing. It was down the line a little bit. might have been about the number five performer today in the Dow. But it is in what I consider to be a very bullish pattern. Uh, we had a beautiful move to the upside. Uh, we've got this cup that has formed over the last two and a half months. And I think we are pulling back into what appears to me to be a handle back near gap support, the rising 20 day, a breakout above, say, 365 or so on a closing basis with volume accompanying that move heavier than normal volume would suggest probably about a fifty five dollar move based on the depth of this cup. Uh, so that would take us up to about four twenty or so on Boeing. I think this chart looks very bullish. Uh, looking within the S&P 500, it was littered at the top of the leaderboard with energy companies. I could go through a bunch. I'll just pull up a couple here. Actually, uh, CHK, which is Chesapeake Energy, was the first one. This was the top performer in the S&P 500. Beautiful move up earlier in May. We pulled back, didn't even get to that 20-day moving average, starting to reverse back up, up 5.6% today. Very strong action in uh, CHK. Uh, COP which is ConocoPhillips, mentioned this one in my setups uh, yesterday. This wasn't my main pick for the week, but uh, COP was one of the setups. You can see it coming back down here, testing the 50-day, testing this price support level at 64. Beautiful move back up today, gaining over 4% on the session. Uh, another stock that was in the top of the S&P 500, it was kind of strange because it just stuck out like a sore thumb with all the energy companies, was Monster, MNST. This is a, uh, a beverage company. Uh, they announced or authorized a new 500 million share or $500 million share repurchase program. The stock has been trading below its 20 day moving average really since the top back in January. It's moving back up today. Volume is beginning to pick up. This could be a pretty significant move technically on Monster. It had gapped down on big volume in the second week of May. You can see these reaction highs coming up in here, 50, 51 area, but not able to close the deal. It looks to me like today could be the day. So Monster having a very strong session. Want to mention the biotechs. I think this is a group that looks very interesting, especially as we head into the summer months when they tend to perform really well. You might look at this and say, well, you know, it's been kind of consolidating pretty weakly here at the low end of a three, four month range. Just again, keep in mind the long-term chart on these bios. We had just recently put in a new high back in January. Yes, it's been weak here uh, recently. I would watch 1850. Actually, I would say 1800 to 1850. This was the area of a major breakout. We had been downtrending, came back up with reaction highs around 1800. We were able to break through and uh, subsequent weakness has been down to about 1850 and that's about it. So I think 1800 to 1850 actually is very solid support on the biotechs. I like the fact that they're moving up. Uh, full disclosure, I do own the IBB, which is an ETF that tracks the group, and it is trying to make a breakout today. Uh, the one other uh, group I wanted to mention was the um, healthcare providers, the DJUSHP, because I think this is another chart that looks really good. Uh, healthcare is one of the leading groups today, one of the leading sectors, and this is a strong industry group within this space. After the move down, again, you might look at it and say, well, we haven't even gotten back to the January high, but what I see here is a continuation pattern. This is a inverse left shoulder, left side of a neckline, head, right side of a neckline, right inverse shoulder, breakout, test the rising 20, and now we're trying to break out again. I think this looks really good. And if you look at it and you say, well, this not really following an uptrend, I think you got to look at a longer term weekly chart here. I think it's pretty clear we were in an uptrend before this pattern developed. I think this is a bullish uh, pattern here. OK, uh, I want to make sure I give uh, Mark Chaikin a lot of time. I know uh, it's been a few months, Mark, since you were with us. You were bullish back uh, in January. But of course, we had a lot of volatility. Or maybe, maybe it was February, but we had a lot of volatility we were going through. I think all of that's behind us. The volatility index has really settled down. It seems like the market is kind of regaining its strength. And so I'm looking forward to your presentation today. Well, thank you, Tom. And uh, let me get the PowerPoint up. And we're off and running. So today we're gonna to talk about combining fundamentals with technicals to improve your trading and investment performance. Uh, 
Just a disclaimer, we're not registered with any um, federal or state agency, so all the examples in today's webinar are for educational purposes only. Uh, as many of you know, I've been on Wall Street a long time, developed some technical indicators that um, have really stood the test of time, like check and money flow, which has always been a go-to indicator on stockcharts.com. For 45 years, I've been using technical analysis, but always in conjunction with fundamentals. Always recognize that fundamentals drive the market. That's enabled me to survive 10 bear markets. And along the way, I've been mentored by some of the smartest and most successful institutional investors. Some of them were clients, some of them were colleagues. We had an institutional brokerage firm in the late 80s that we sold to a subsidiary of Reuters. And when I came out of retirement in 2009, uh, after the financial collapse, I created the Chaikin Power Gauge rating. And it's the culmination of my life's work. I draw on everything I learned from my smart institutional clients. All of them had different styles and different time horizons. And that's our go-to fundamental indicator. But before we get to that, I want to review the market. As Tom said, we've had a lot of volatility. I like to say that we've uh, gone from an uptrend on autopilot in 2017 to a roller coaster of a correction. And when I was on back in uh, February, on February 28th, actually, we were just um, completing the first leg of that down move from the January peak. And we didn't know if it was going to be a V-shaped bottom or a W bottom. But what happened was we corrected more than 10% on a closing basis on the S&P. So we went from a pullback to a correction. And Almost invariably in my career, when you have a decline of more than 10%, it ends up bottoming out in the form of the letter W. And we're going to look at a longer-term chart in a second, five-year chart. So this is a one-year chart of the SPY. Check and money flow was strong all through 2017. Why? Because institutions were using the SPY to get instant equity exposure. If they sold a block of IBM, they sold a block of Facebook, they want to stay fully invested what do they do? Just like you and I, they buy the SPY. But then as we came back down and formed that W bottom and got a little bit choppy, check and money flow was weak. And it's just in the last month or so that it's gotten strong again as we've rallied up, broken a downtrend and waiting for that big breakout above 2750 to tell us that we're on our way to new highs. I think that's going to come. It's probably going to come as we get closer to second quarter earnings season. Looking at the bigger picture, this is a five-year chart of the SPY. We see those V-shaped bottoms. Those are pullbacks of 5 to 10%. And that's why you hear people on CNBC saying, buy the dips. When you get a bigger correction, as we did in 2015 in the fall, and then in the early part of 2016, 10% or more, you form a W bottom. You had two more V-shaped bottoms. The final one was the market action right before the presidential election, November of 16. And then look what's missing. No pullbacks at all in 2017. If you stayed fully invested, it was a wonderful year. If you were guessing of a correction was coming, it wasn't so pleasant because you were always on the sideline waiting for an opportunity to get in. And you got that opportunity in January. But guess what? All the money came into the ETFs in January, and then it flowed back out again in February and March because people react emotionally to market moves. And part of what we're going to focus on today is how you can stay disciplined, focused, and unemotional about making your trading and investment decisions. So let's put pullbacks into perspective. Since 1945, there have been 75, now 76 declines of 5 to 10%. They average 6% usually take a month, and then they recover to new highs within a month. So buy the dips works most of the time. There have been 28 declines of between 10 and 20%. They average 13%, and they typically average four months in length. Well, guess what? The peak of the market was January 26th. We're now on May 30th or 31st, so four months in. This is pretty typical. And the intraday decline was 13.4%. So if you're wondering whether we're in a period that's sort of an outlier, we're not. This is just average. And the good news is you recover to new highs within three months of the bottom 
when you come out of that uh, corrective phase. So everything is positioned for a breakout. I think that second quarter earnings are going to trigger it. First quarter earnings season was really difficult, as you know. There was a lot of sell on the news mentality. We saw it today in Michael Coors, a stock that's in our deck, uh, where they reported great results but uh, and guided higher and still sold off over 10%. So one of the indicators that I like to look at, the previous charts are from Chaken Analytics. I'm going to try and intersperse a lot of charts from StockCharts.com. And then at the end, show you a special uh, new product with a special offer that we have for you. I like to look at the percentage of stocks in the S&P 500 that are above their 50-day average. So you see the W that formed. And now we've rallied up, and it, it's maintained a fairly bullish posture. This is a chart. Uh, which combines an MACD, an RSI, as well as the percentage of stocks above their 50-day average. So in spite of the whippiness in the market, four days down, now we finally reverse the upside, percentage of stocks above their 50-day average is relatively strong, holding above the 50 level. So it's not just the FANG stocks that are pulling us up. Now, in case you're not bullish and you want a strategy to benefit from a test of the lows or a, another down leg, uh, this is something we really like, vertical put spreads. You buy the 271 put, and this was earlier today, we're above 271 now, and to reduce the cost of that put from $520, you sell a 259 put against it. It's called a bearish vertical put spread if the S&P drops 4.5% by July 20th, and that's almost two months from now, you make almost 300% on your money. So put spreads, particularly vertical on the downside and call spreads on the upside, great way to have a predefined risk, protect the portfolio or profit on the downside. Again, not a recommendation, just an idea. Now, what should you be focusing on in 2018? We've been saying this since the year began. Trend of corporate earnings, very strong. First quarter earnings just blew it out. Part of that was the tax increase. But it's now projected that second quarter earnings are going to be fabulous, above 20% potentially in the S&P 500. You want to look at interest rates, but don't focus on them. Don't get fixated on the 3% level on the 10-year or whether they've dropped 20 basis points or rallied 20 basis points. A lot of factors. So for instance, one factor that affected the drop in interest rates is the fact that European sovereign debt is terrible. Italy being a prime example, but not just Italy, Greece, and Germany, and Spain again. So what happens? We become the safe haven. But we're also the best earnings-growing country on the planet right now. Europe has underperformed. Interesting note, in the first quarter, where do you think the biggest inflow of money into ETFs was? Emerging markets and EFA, the European stocks. Guess who underperformed in the second quarter? Emerging markets and EFA. US has been steady eddy all the way through. You want to look at industry group, sector strength and weakness, and primarily stock selection using the check and power gauges, which is what I do. So the likely scenario for 2018 is rising earnings and higher interest rates. This chart is courtesy of Bank America. Merrill Lynch, we've been using it for two years now, and it's worked because when interest rates go up because the economy is strong, that's actually bullish. So don't listen to the screamers on CNBC telling you to you know, be fearful when you go above 3% on the interest rates. Now it's actually flip-flops of the financials want higher interest rates. It's all noise. Ignore the headlines. Please ignore the headlines. Hey, Mark. And yes. Uh, I was just going to ask you a question about that. I mean, if you're looking at higher interest rates, would you um, be looking to overweight financial stocks because of their propensity to move higher with higher rates? I absolutely would uh, overweight financials. There's something called the net interest margin. It's the difference between what banks borrow at and what they lend at, and that typically go expands as interest rates go up. I'd also be looking at small caps because small caps tend to do better in a rising interest rate environment. The one outlier, as you and I discussed, Tom, is the insurance industry. Can't figure that one out, so I go with the technicals because the technicals are always right. Mm -hmm. okay. And that, that's the beauty of technical analysis and what stock charts brings to the table. Yeah, I wanted I just wanted to mention that because financials got hit so hard with this sudden drop, you know, and the XLF had pulled back to key support. 
as did the bank index. The Dow Jones U.S. Bank Index came down to that 455 area, which has been a key area of support for the past few months throughout this volatile period. So I uh, just wanted to get your thoughts on that uh, with the weakness that we've seen. Yeah, and there's a second factor in there, Tom. It's the contagion factor. Uh, Jim Cramer actually talked about that a lot yesterday on CNBC. Uh, there was this fear that whatever's going wrong in Europe, or at least not working right now, might spill over here. And, and that's just um, conjecture. And that gets you in trouble because you move to the sidelines and then you get a day like today and you're saying, why did I sell? So uh, I think it's important to zero in on what segments of the market are doing well. And over the last three months, this is uh, a chart that combines our power bar ratings, which look at the number of stocks in a particular index with bullish or bearish fundamental ratings in our model, and also price performance. You see that small caps and mid caps are really what's been driving the market along with a little bit of the NASDAQ. Down at the bottom are the large cap indices over the last three months, Dow Jones, S&P 500, Russell 1. So it's important to zero in on the areas of the market, both sectors and industry groups, as well as indices uh, that are likely to give you the best bang for the buck. So Here's the Russell 2000, whereas the S&P 500 is struggling against resistance, the S&P uh, has a long way to go here, about 4 or 5% to go, or 4% to get to a new high. Russell 2000 making new highs. Strong shake in money flow, outperforming the large caps. This is very bullish, and it's a bullish indicator just uh, overall for large caps as well. In fact, may actually be um, a tell that large caps are going to start out performing again. So here's an example of a small cap stock that and we're going to get into what on this chart power gauge rating is at the bottom, which is our fundamental indicator. But this is mammoth energy. The symbol is TUSK. And uh, I use this example because my wife, Sandy, who uh, is the prototype for having applied the Chaikin methodology of technicals and fundamentals, bought it on this uh, buy signal back here and added to her position when it dipped on earnings. And then she sold it out on yesterday's spike when it was announced that Mammoth had gotten the contract to help rebuild the Puerto Rican um, electrical grid. So this is an example of a stock, a small cap stock, not very well known. If you know the fundamentals, the technicals were strong. You can get into stocks like this and sometimes get lucky when you get an, an announcement like that. Uh, so lots of information. You get it from Aaron and Tom every day. You get it from Chaikin, uh, CNBC, you name it, wherever you go for your information. There's just too much information to process. So you've got to have a way to narrow it all down. And for us, the Chaikin power gauge rating is a way to cut through the clutter of fundamental data and have a, an informed opinion. So we take all the data that's on the right, massage it, distill it down to four primary factors, as you'll see, 20 sub-factors, into a rating that goes from very bearish to very bullish. And we call that the Chaikin power gauge rating. Rolled out in 2010, never changed. The factors are the same. The weights are the same. Proven stood the test of time. There were two ETFs with over $800 million. That One of them is only a year old. The other is less than six months old that are managed on a long-term basis using NASDAQ Chaikin Industries. The whole point being, if you have a fundamental view and as a trader combine it with technicals, you can really supercharge your trading performance. So I've always felt, as I said in the beginning, fundamentals drive the market, but emotions drive the market to extremes. We saw that yesterday. So for me, the path to profits has always been to combine fundamentals with technicals. The trick is, how do you do that? Because if you can, you can help conquer the emotional swings that tend to destroy our trading performance. Well, we have something in the shake and power gauge that gives you a directional edge combining fundamentals with technicals into a quantitative model, then taking a disciplined set of buy and sell signals for entry points. And you all have your favorites, whether they're candlestick patterns or MACD or PPI or PMO, whatever it is, just use a disciplined pattern for your entries once you've identified the stocks you want to be long or short. So this pyramid sums it up. This is a discipline methodology. My wife, Sandy, who never bought a stock until four years ago, and just kills it. 
were going back to Italy for a month on the profits she took out of Mammoth. So at the top of the pyramid, taking power gauge rating, very powerful indicator. Industry group strength, very important. At the bottom, I look at just two technical indicators, check and money flow, which measures institutional buying and selling, and our unique way of looking at relative strength, which you can sort of simulate on stock charts using the scooter index. And then in the middle, check and buy and sell signals. So the power gauge is simple. It was meant to be easy to understand, but under the surface, there's a lot of number crunching going on. What I like to say is that the power gauge rating is like a Chevrolet with a Ferrari engine under the hood. And it can be your GPS during earnings season, pointing you towards stocks that are likely to outperform analyst estimates and stocks that are likely to miss and take it on the chin. And we're going to show you some examples of that in a minute. So what's in the Chaikin power gauge rating? Well, we look at value, growth, technical and sentiment factors. Technicals are only 15%. And I mentioned earlier that my institutional clients all had different styles and time horizons. So rather than build a value model or a growth model or a dividend model, I set out when I built the check and power gauge rating to draw on everything I knew these successful investors looked at. And they all had different time horizons. Some were shorter, some were longer. And the end result is the check and power gauge rating and it works because it's based on how Wall Street works. It's not a model built by a newly minted PhD. That's what got us in trouble in 2008 and back in 1998. For those of you who were around then when long-term capital almost blew up, when two Nobel Prize winners built a model on interest rates that you know, didn't stand the test of the real world market, this model works because these are the factors that successful institutional investors look at every day. And we don't have enough time to do this research ourselves. You could spend two hours researching a stock. You'd come up with Marathon Petroleum or Boeing, which by the way, has a bullish trading in the check and power gauge. But you don't need to do that because the power gauge does that work for you. So a couple of performance numbers, 2016, the average very bullish stock up 32%. Average very bearish stock up 10%. Still a good spread, but in 2015, it was important to know which stocks had bearish ratings because you had a bear market in small caps and energy stocks. So the average very bearish stock in the Russell 3000 in 2015 down 17%. Kinder Morgan, Range Resources, Rail Stocks, Under Armour. These are the stocks you need to avoid or use as short sale candidates. So we've developed two patterns. One we call the classic check and bull. Power gauge rating is bullish. So right now it would be Boeing or Marathon Petroleum or Centene in the healthcare sector. Stock is outperforming the market and check and money flow is strong above the zero line continuously for as long as it can, telling you that there's institutional accumulation. When I find a stock like that, I very often make it my bullish stock of the week in check and market insights that I write every Sunday. So on April 1st, I made E-Trade my bullish stock of the week. It was 55.41. And let's take a look at why I did that. We read the chart from the bottom up. Check and power gauge is a ribbon at the bottom. It was green telling me that the power gauge was bullish. Next is our unique way of looking at relative strength. As I said, somewhat similar to Scooter. It's a little bit more sensitive, so it'll uh, perform at the bottom like Scooter does, but at the top, it'll turn bearish a little bit sooner, but you can get a similar outlook, as you'll see in a minute, from Scooter. So we like to see the market agree with the model. Fundamentals bullish, outperforming the market. If check and money flow shows you that the institutions are buying, then you're looking for dips to buy the stock as a swing trader, an options trader, or add it to your 401k plan. So that buy signal, we call it a money flow buy, came on April 1st. That's the reason I made this my bullish stock of the week. Everything lined up and I got a buy signal. And E-Trade went from 55 to 65, now pulling back a bit. The one segment of the um, financial sector that's stood up very well here even with interest rates pulling back, are the brokers and the investment managers. So interactive brokers, Evercore, Raymond James, E-Trade, all made new highs within the last week. And that's really outperformance. That's what happens when everything lines up. 
Now, on the opposite end of the spectrum, classic bears, power gauge rating is bearish, stock is underperforming the market, check and money flow is red, not green. What does that tell us? Institutions are selling the stock. So again, we read the chart from the bottom up, power gauge is bearish, that means the fundamentals are going against the stock, underperforming the market, institutions selling. This is a drug and biotech stock. Part of the reason the biotech index has not made new highs is that a few of the stocks like Tesoro are a drag on the index. But notice that here's a stock that while the market was making new highs, so it was a mid cap stock, now a small cap stock, gone from 150 all the way down to 46. These are the stocks you have to avoid. Do not bottom fish. It doesn't pay. We'll see that in a few slides. So three other patterns. Dynamic duo, personality changes, and a very special way to look at shaken money flow that finds stealth accumulation and distribution patterns. So what is the dynamic duo? Combination of the shaken power gauge rating and relative strength. Finds big winners on the upside and the downside. And then personality changes, really important. You see them with Scooter, stock that's been Underperforming the market starts to outperform or vice versa. Here's an example of that. We use this in our February 28th webinar, Michael Coors. Here's the personality change back here in August. It went from underperforming to outperforming. I'm going to show you a stock charts chart in the next slide. When that happens, and it happened because of an earnings surprise that caused the stock to spike up, you don't want to buy that spike. You want to wait for the first buy signal. And when you get that pullback, make a new eight-day low, we get a buy signal, everything's lined up. There's other buy signals along the way. You get another positive earnings surprise, a third one, and then look what happened today. Stock down 12%. Now, what's the difference? On this first earnings surprise and the second one, the stock was not spiking higher in an uptrend. On this earnings surprise here, you were already making a new 52-week high, and the market has been very unforgiving, as we said, sell on the news. So earnings were better than expected. This might be a buying opportunity in Michael Kors. It's given up an awful lot of ground. Looks like one of those financial stocks that Tom was talking about. Here's what it looks like in stock charts. Same indicators. Scooter, instead of our relative strength, showed you that personality change on the spike. So very similar, institutional buying. You can do this in stock charts by looking at shaken money flow and scooter for your relative strength indicator. For the more sensitive top indicators, I've just read stock charts for dummies. You go to the other relative strength indicators in stock charts to get a more sensitive top rollover indicator. Now here's a recent example of a bullish personality change, Macy's. Bullish personality change back in November. You wait for the first buy signal. That's a pullback. Other buy signals along the way. And Macy's is making a new all-time high today. Very powerful combination. Fundamentals, technicals, and these signals with money flow thrown in. You really get the full package. Now, on the downside, a bearish personality change is like a red flag. You got it back here on Avalon Bay, largest REIT in the rental property area. Then the power gauge turns bearish. Now the market and the model agree. Institutions are selling, so you want to avoid the stock. Don't get tempted and bottom fish because these signals on the downside are really where you're going to make money in stocks like Avalon Bay. So now the secret sell signal, and we taught this to institutional traders for over 30 years because check and money flow has been around since 1982. We call it the bearish check and money flow sell alert. Here's advanced auto parts. This chart ends in May of 17. In January of 17, the stock equaled its previous peak near the upper volatility band. These are Keltner channels. And check and money flow should have gone green above zero. Instead, it stayed red or below zero. What did that tell us? Smart money was selling under cover of strength in the stock. Power gauge had been bearish. You got a burst on an earnings report. But smart money was getting out. And you need to get out with them. That came at 175. The stock broke support. 
power gauge turned bearish, started underperforming. Institutions kept selling at the ultimate low, 78.87 in the fall of 2017. So let's look at one example that sums up everything we've talked about here. This is DR Horton. It became a favorite of ours back in September. Why? Because reading the chart from the bottom up, the power gauge was bullish, so fundamentals are strong. Outperforming the market, institutions buying it. It had given a buy signal. I didn't pick up on it then, but I made it my bullish stock of the week here in September with the stock at about 36. And it went in a straight line to 53, and money flow stayed green or positive almost all the way until that peak when you got a bearish money flow sell alert. So that tells me two things. If I'm still long, I want to get out. I want to be skeptical about the home building stocks because this was the leader and someone's liquidating it. I don't know who. And then you get a bearish personality change. And now some of our relative strength sell signals are actually working. And I still want to avoid the home builders. Toll Brothers had a disastrous report in the last week. What you have here is a sector that's being affected by rising interest rates, and we don't know why it's not performing well. You don't have to know why. That's what the technicals are all about. So technicals plus the power gauge works, and relative strength is really important. This is what it looks like on stock charts. There's your peak. There's your negative check in money flow. That's your exit point, and then you want to avoid buy signals after that. Move on, go somewhere else. Now, notice that Scooter didn't get bearish till just recently. So if we go back, that's why I said in stock charts, if you want a more sensitive technical indicator on relative strength, you have to use one of the other relative strength indicators. In Chaikin, we have a more sensitive relative strength indicator. It's a stochastic of relative strength. So I'd like to show you how to profit from volatility. Because volatility equals opportunity. We had a lot of it beginning in early February. As Tom said, it's abated now. What I look for are bullish power gauge rated stocks that I can buy at depressed prices. So I love the refiners. Marathon Petroleum made a bid for Andavir, which used to be Tesoro. It's going to be a monolith of profitable oil refining and retailing. So what do I do? Well, when I see a buy signal, or when I get a dip like we had two days ago based on rumors that they might lift the cap on oil production in Russia and Saudi Arabia, looking for buying opportunities. Why? Because looking at the chart from the bottom up, power gauge is bullish, still outperforming the market, still in a nice uptrend, love marathon petroleum. On the downside, prepare yourself for earning surprises because that's where you can make big money with those vertical bearish put spreads. So here's one that my partner, our chief market strategist, Dan Russo, recommended. And by the way, Dan's doing a, a power feed analysis on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday on Stock Charts TV at 9.15. He recommended a bearish put strategy on Philip Morris just two days before the earnings. And you can see why he did it. Power gauge was bearish, underperforming, institutional selling, you get a negative earnings surprise, a big gap down, stock went from 102 all the way to 80. So you can prepare yourself for earnings surprises with the Chaikin power gauge. As I said earlier, it's your GPS during earnings season. Now, let's look at something completely different. The charts we've been looking at are from Chaikin Analytics. It's our high-end analytics workstation and from stockcharts.com. In February, we showed people our newest product called Power Pulse. It's a way to position your portfolio for success using the Chaikin Power Gauge rating. We've sort of extracted the best of Chaikin Analytics and put it into a more affordable product for the average trader or investor, and we call it Power Pulse. So here's a chart from Power Pulse of another oil refiner that we like, and we like it because the Power Gauge is bullish. This is Valero Energy didn't even dip uh, in the last two or three days. So we're looking for a dip to buy it. You've got the relative strength indicator, check in money flow, extremely strong. Here's your power gauge. This is available on both desktop and mobile. You can get this on your iPhone. 
or your Android, and there'll be an app in the store in probably three months. Right now, you have to put it into a URL, but it's very simple. So there's a bullish stock from Power Pulse. I'd like to revisit a stock I talked about on February 28th because Tom and Aaron were talking about Albemarle Corp. Um, I had made it my bearish stock of the week on January 7th at 132. When I was on, on February 28th, it was 105. This is the chart we used. And it had just triggered a sell signal. So I'm a big proponent that bottom fishing is the most expensive sport in America. Don't do it. One out of 10 times, you'll be right. The other nine times, you destroy your psyche and your pocketbook. So look what happened to Albemarle after we were on on February 28th. That second sell signal triggered a decline below 90. Still can't recover 93. Remember, it was 105 down from 132. Bottom fishing just doesn't work. So avoid it at all costs, but use a stock like Albemarle to put on put positions when the stock rallies up. That's what we call our relative strength sell signal. You move above the 21-day average and a stock that's underperforming the market, drop back below the 21-day average. We call that a relative strength sell signal. Really powerful signal, works about 70% of the time. And the good news is these signals last for four to eight weeks. So you can put on an options position that doesn't put you under the stress of premium erosion on an option that's due to expire in a week or two weeks. You can put on a more sensible options position. And I used to run an options department. I know that most people lose money in options because they put themselves under the gun. A, they don't have a directional edge, which the power gauge will give you and relative strength. And B, they tend to buy short duration out of the money options. That's a loser's game. So we've combined three powerful investment tools and one great solution for both desktop and mobile. And we call it Power Pulse. So you get personal portfolio monitoring, done for you stock analysis with the power gauge and my weekly market commentary all comes bundled into one product. And we made this offer on February 28th. We got a huge response, over 150 stock charts. Uh, users subscribe to PowerPulse, and they keep re-upping every month, $24.95 a month for this package of indicators and fundamental research that can really supercharge your uh, trading profits. You've got a great technical package in stock charts. We add the fundamentals, combine it all on one chart so you don't have to jump around if you don't want to. So you can go to chickenanalytics.com slash stock charts and take advantage of this 50% discount for stock charts users. It expires on Sunday, June 3rd. So by all means, take a look. It really encapsulates everything we've talked about on this webinar and of course, uh, a hearty thanks to Aaron and Tom for having me on initially in February. Hard to believe I came in within one minute of my time deadline. Never done that before. So uh, there must be good karma coming from Italy after all. But uh, Tom, if, Aaron, if there's anything you want to ask in the final couple of seconds, I'm happy to answer it. Well, I do want to just uh, say, first of all, it's a great presentation. Um, and you made a comment just a couple of minutes ago that I picked up on it. I don't recall exactly which uh, signal you were talking about, but you said it works 70% of the time. And I think that's an, an important thing to say because I think everyone's always looking for, you know, the one signal that's going to work all the time. And I don't know about you, Mark, but I've, I'm not aware of it. Uh, I don't, I don't think there's a such signal out there. So you've always got to be prepared in case a trade or a signal. Uh, gives you the wrong signal and, and things start to go against you. Um, and the other thing I would point out is on that ALB chart, which was a great call uh, that you made back in February, on the weekly chart, it really shows that long-term character change that you referred to during your presentation. I mean, it was in a nice uptrend for a while, several years, and then big volume came in in January and completely changed the, the nature of that chart. And so I just wanted to mention, if you took a look and when it, you know, looked at a big picture um, on Albemarle, it really, uh, really did change character back in January. That was a great call. Yeah, and those five-year charts that I uh, showed on the S&P are also available on Chaken Analytics. It's really important uh, 
to the stocks you're following to know what that long-term trend is. We tend to zero in on the shorter term time horizons, but you're absolutely right. That was the relative strength sell signal. Stocks underperforming the markets, so think scooter under 20 or under 10, rallies up, goes above the 21-day average, drops back below. That's the key. Wait for it to tell you that the rally is over, and that signal is reliable 70% of the time. All right. I think what we'll do is, um, if we can, let's go ahead and pull up the poll because there was a question earlier uh, for all of those watching the, uh, the the show today, whether or not they use uh, the Chaikin uh, indicators and uh, how or how often do you use Chaikin money flow in your charts? And there you can see the results. Uh, Thirty-eight percent said it's on almost all of my charts. Thirty-four percent said sometimes. And 20% said never, 8% said what is CMF. Um, but I have a feeling after your presentation today, if we did this next time you're on that, those percentages are going to be higher. It's amazing stuff. Well, that's great, Tom. And uh, Chaikin Money Flow has been around since 1982 when Chip started stock charts. He put that in as one of his core indicators, and I think it stood the test of time. Again, really appreciate the opportunity to share some market wisdom with uh, the stock charts community. Awesome. Really glad to have you. Yes, absolutely. I just wanted to ask, uh, you know, a few questions, but the main one, let's see, do, does the power gauge work for ETFs? It sounded like you include them or is it just individual stocks? Right now we have relative strength for ETFs on July 1. We're going to roll out a power gauge rating for all ETFs that combines fundamentals and technicals. If it's a U.S. equity ETF and just technicals, if it's, um, a uh, single tradable or a European. So we will have a power gauge rating for ETFs. Right now, the relative strength, uh, Aaron, really works well on ETFs. Uh, these are big macro trends. And you know when staples and real estate turn down, they stay down for four and six months at a time. So relative strength can really do it, but we're going to combine the fundamentals with the technicals on ETFs as well. That's coming up. All right. Uh, that, that really is the gist of it here in the chat room. I would recommend everybody go to the Chicken Money Flow chart school article. I did post that link in the chat room because I think it'll answer most of the questions that everybody has regarding the formula and, and that sort of thing for scanning. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think you had said, uh, did you talk about it? I'm sorry. I was watching the, the chat room about scanning and using Chicken Money Flow. Is there a certain certain parameters that you recommend? I didn't talk about it. What I recommend is if you get a stock that pulls back and then gives you um, an oscillator buy, whether you're looking at MACD or PMO, if check and money flow is green or positive when you get the buy, that's what you want to scan for. Those are the most reliable short-term entry levels that I've found using check and money flow. I don't, the crossing zero line doesn't do much for me. But if it stays green on a pullback, it's telling you that institutions are not contributing to the decline. They're actually taking advantage of it by buying on weakness. All right. Excellent. Well, we certainly uh, enjoyed having you on here today, Mark, and I'm, I'm uh, hoping that you'll agree to come back again in a couple months. And I think we'll probably be at a point where we're higher on the major indices. It's at least what I'm looking at. And uh, so we'd love to have you back and give us an update in a couple months. Be my pleasure. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Thanks again, Mark. And uh, there he goes. A great presentation. Always great to hear from Mark Chaikin to hear uh, what he's looking at in the market. Uh, I know that Dan Russo, when he was on also, uh, was fairly bullish about the market and the things that they were seeing in the market. And uh, so it's good to get everybody, everyone's perspective on uh, how they approach the market and what looks good and what doesn't and so forth. But let's go ahead and roll. Uh, we got the 10 in 10 up next for everyone. And Aaron, I see you are fast at work there looking at yes. these uh, different requests on the RRG. What do you have? Yes, we had, let's see, we have about 30 something uh, listed here. We'll try and get to 35. So only 10 of them are gonna make it. Everybody vote in the chat room if you're watching live, like other people's requests, because the uh, most popular will be the second, regardless of whether we looked at it yesterday and the day before and the day before. The rest of them, I do try and keep, uh, try and look at only ones we haven't seen for over a week, uh, as well as check out that RRG. So I'm going to just show that really quickly, and then we'll get ourselves going. 
and I'm going to use the daily since we are looking at these in the very short term time frame. And we will take these down and here we go. All right. So I can see a few interesting ones as far as our heading is concerned. And I think really I'm going to look at some of these yellows that are going northeast. Uh, typically that's, you know, I think uh, you guys, you and Julius talked about that before about actually being in the weakening category and then turning back up toward leading. So that might be something we'll look at. But in general, I try and mix it up between sectors and those charts that I simply find interesting. So with that, let's go ahead and start with the first symbol, which is Constellation Brands STZ. Okay. STZ, hold the chart up, haven't annotated it yet. Uh, first of all, I would just say this is one clearly over the last few months that have just been, has been sideways consolidating. So it's not really um, showing me a whole lot here. Uh, I do like today's action, obviously, because the stock's up 2.3%. It is uh, moving to about a four week high, uh, but otherwise it's sitting in the middle of a, of a trading range. Uh, and I'll highlight that for you here on the chart. Uh, the, the high at the end of April, you can see, was about 233.5. And the low that we saw back in early February when the market was selling off was down closer to 207.5. So I think we're sitting in a trading range. And I don't know that I really like anything about the stock until it either breaks out uh, on the upside or maybe pulls back and gets closer to the support level, which would improve the reward to risk. So if I'm in it, I'm just okay with it. Uh, if I'm not in it, I'm looking for something else. All right. And the most popular request in the chat room is NVIDIA, NVDA, of course. Yeah, NVIDIA has been a great performer for a long time, and that's recognized if we pulled up a long-term chart and showed the scooter. Uh, NVIDIA has been in the top you know, 5% of stocks for a long time, and uh, it gets there by having consistently good performance relative to its peers. Uh, I found that the reversing candle that was right on that rising 20 day moving average was uh, certainly a pretty good sign. And I'm talking about this right here. So we had a breakout above this double top. Uh, it came on increasing volume, which we like to see. We failed to hold the breakout level. And I'll show you that here was the, the level that I was watching. So with good volume, we went through it. We failed to hold it, but notice we're holding the rising 20 day. And that's one thing, again, that I've changed over the years in my thinking. I used to be solely price uh, and volume, you know, looking at price support levels. And if I lost it, then I'd get out. And then I realized a lot of times these stocks were going down just below price support, hitting a rising 20 day and then taking back off again. And that's exactly what it looks like is happening here with NVIDIA. Uh, we got the NASDAQ breaking out. I would expect that NVIDIA is going to be breaking out sooner rather than later. 260 is the level you want to see cleared. All right. Let's see. The other very popular one, and actually the vote was split, so it actually was the most popular, is Kinder Morgan, KMI. And I guess uh, the Canadian Prime Minister announced that Canada will buy Trans Mountain Pipeline for cash. So they're wondering how Kinder Morgan looks. Well, I tend to ignore the uh, a lot of the uh, the noise and the news out there, and I just look and see how they perform technically, the charts. And I think uh, for now, anyway, Kinder Morgan is performing okay, but we haven't seen that big move that we've seen um, uh, among a lot of its peers, and it continues to trade in the trading range between 1575 and almost 1675, and we're getting toward the upper end of that. So I do like the fact that we bounced off support and the volume's picking up, but we've yet to make this breakout here. And we're well off of the high that we saw back in January, which is not great action when you consider it relative to many of its peers. So I'm not a big fan of KMI. Uh, I would have to at least either see a breakout above 1675 with volume expanding or another test of key support at 1575 before I would consider trading. And the fact that it's an underperformer like Mark Chaikin was talking about, uh, probably leads me to doing nothing with the stock. All right. The next one, the only one from Consumer Staples, uh, Castle Brands, ROX. <clears throat> All right. Um, let's see. Well, it's only a $1.27 stock, so keep that in mind. 
uh, the volume also is fairly light usually. So the dollar volume, which is what you get when you, when you take the price of the stock and multiply it times the volume, it doesn't require a whole lot of dollars to completely control what's going on in this stock. So I, I don't think there's enough. Well, I know for me, there's not enough liquidity to even consider trading this stock. But in the meantime, I think uh, for the past four, three to four months, we've been trading in this 115 to 133 range. We're sitting maybe a little bit more toward the top end of it. I don't see a trade here. And again, because of the uh, lack of liquidity, I would avoid it. Okay. The next one will be uh, MRC. This is uh, Industrial Machinery Industry Group. Okay, MRC. Really nice action here. This is exactly what I look for. I mean, this is my strategy to a T. I like to find stocks that are trending higher. I like to find stocks that are outperforming their peers. I like to find stocks that pull back and hit key support, like the rising 20-day moving average. And you can see on this move through, volume was very heavy. Uh, I think that confirms the uh, trend. And what I always like to see is when a stock pulls back after, you know, here you can see the PPO took off through the center line resistance and started accelerating above the zero line. When you get a pullback and you test or even go below a key support line or moving average, like the 20 day moving average, and then reverse back, print a hammer off of a downtrend. I think that's a great sign. We moved right up off of that, broke to a new high. PPO was higher at this most recent high. We did have a temporary reversing candle there, bearish and golfing, but I think we, we went down, printed that uh, 20 day test. And I think we're moving back up again. I would be uh, expecting another breakout here on MRC. Okay. Uh, another popular one, it has been a week and a lot of people requested it. It's the only utility requested, AT&T. Yeah, I've talked about this one. I'm not a fan. I, I, you know, uh, This also gets back to what uh, Mark was talking about where it's just not worth trying to uh, catch a bottom on these stocks, look at the massive volume that uh, we saw on AT&T on this gap down. Um, we're, we're battling trying to get through the 20 day moving average, but even if we did, did, I think that this area right around 3350 is a level that's gonna be very difficult for the bulls to penetrate. So I'm just not a fan. I would look elsewhere and avoid AT&T. All right. The next one will be UNP. <clears throat> Let's see, where did I find that one? UNP is uh, Railroad, Union Pacific, of course. Railroads are performing great. I've uh, written a lot about the transports and the fact that the railroads are the strongest area of transports. I think the fact that the railroads are doing well is another uh, reason to believe that the U.S. economy is stronger than other areas or, or other economies around the world. And as a result, that's normally when you see outperformance by railroads, and we are definitely getting it here. Beautiful breakout, continuing to hold this rising 20-day moving average. I think as long as UNP uh, holds 140 support right in here, I would be okay owning it. I like UNP. Okay. The next one is the, let's see, PBR, professional bull riding. No, I'm sorry, um, Brazil Petrol. Yeah, um, the huge move down. Look at the volume coming in. It had a breakout. I'm not sure if this was earnings related or maybe something fundamental to their business, but that's a lot of selling and a huge drop. And that combination worries me. I mean, we may stabilize for a little bit, but I expect the next big move is probably going to continue this, uh, this recent drop. So I would be watching maybe a couple of areas. I think that is going to be a very difficult area around 1320 to close above. I think also if we get back up, there's, there's really two levels. You've got this gap resistance right here at about 1260 and then 1320. Trying to get back through to both of those levels with all of these sellers at, the, at that area, I think it's going to prove to be really difficult. I don't like it. All right. Uh, how about an uh, interesting chart, I think. Uh, Alibaba right now, butting up against some resistance, it looks like. Uh, yeah, it is struggling with some resistance, but I like the way it's behaving. Uh, I like the fact that it, it, you know, the big volume came in in early May on this uh, uh, latest uptrend. So uh, if I was annotating here and saving it, I would certainly want to make sure I'm, I'm aware of that. I think there are a couple areas again on this one to watch. Clearing 200 
is a, a, is a big level. We've tried mid-March, failed. And then finally getting above that 205 level, which was the January high, that's really the uh, key level for Alibaba to take out. So watch those two levels closely. I think we're eventually going to get it. It's just a matter of uh, when. Okay. And our final one is property and casualty insurance industry. And that is S, or I'm sorry, C-I-N-F, Cincinnati Financial. Okay. Yeah. I mean, many of these financials are, have been getting hit. Uh, the insurers, um, you know, so many areas of the financials, especially the more aggressive areas, the banks, the life insurance, the, the uh, um, asset managers, investment services. I think Cincinnati Financial has just come down tested support. Uh, you know, if there's one thing that's confusing me about this market is probably the financials. The fact that uh, we did have a really strong 10-year treasury yield, and many of these aggressive areas of the financials did not participate the way they normally would during rising interest rates. But so far, we're holding support. Um, another comment that, uh, that Mark made earlier, I think, is very astute, is that we try not to ask our que you know, uh, why questions. If a chart breaks down, you just get out. And so for me, CINF, I think the, the, the level really to watch closely here is yesterday's close at 68.50. I think if we go back down and close below that level, especially if you see the volume picking up, I'd be really careful with it. Okay, and that does complete the 10 in 10. And here are your symbols. I will have these charts up in the Market Watchers Live blog. You can just go over there to the blogs page, click on the Market Watchers Live blog and the link to the chart list with all of these charts is right there at the top. Okay, time to talk about that special thing coming up in August called ChartCon 2018. It is our big uh, every other year conference and we would love for you to attend. And you can attend by signing up to watch it online. We are gonna be doing this as an online con conference. We did that in 2016, it was extremely successful. And we were able to reach a lot more people who wanted to, to learn more and see all of our various speakers. So we're continuing it again this year. And the theme is reducing risk in uncharted waters. So if you go to the stockcharts.com slash chartcon, you'll get right to this page and you can click there to register. You'll also be able to see what speakers we have on tap as well as the conference agenda, the preliminary one, of course. And I, I just can't wait. Uh, I always am talking about Dr. Uh, Elder, and he will be there, and I cannot wait to talk his ear off. Uh, if he's listening, I'm just going to apologize right up front. Uh, but he is excellent. So one of the keynote speakers that I recommend uh, you go and sign up for this, because these are going to be some great, great presentations. And with that, I'm going to go now over to our final market update. And here we go. These are our two day, uh, I think it's five minute bar, 10 minute bar chart. And so we can get a really good picture as to what's going on today versus yesterday. Uh, right now, of course, the markets are rebounding after yesterday's decline. And we can see that the Dow is now up uh, as, as well as the S&P. They're backing off a little bit off of the intraday highs, but I'm not too concerned about that. And look at the Russell 2000 continuing to outperform the other, uh, the large cap indexes, it is, they, the Russell 2000 is making new all-time highs. We can see Treasury yields, uh, I'm sorry, the TSX is up on the day, a little bit more choppy trading there. Treasury yields are up currently reading at 2.85%. UUP was uh, gapped down and has been continuing lower, but it does seem to have found uh, the intraday low. We'll have to see if that holds up as support. Commodities are up. We can see that it's probably affected by USO, which is now on the rise, continuing the bounce off of the low from yesterday. Gold is lots of choppy trading today, but it is up, uh, GLD up 14 cents to 
33, and the VIX has pulled back. Yesterday we got up uh, over eight and a, 18 and a half for the VIX, and now we're pulling back. Uh, TLT gapped down, but is moving sideways. Uh, similar look in the opposite direction of the 10-year Treasury yield. I'm going to go very quickly to the member dashboard, and let's look at those predefined alerts and see if anything new has been coming up here. Uh, what I would note is the healthcare sector ETF has had a bearish MACD crossover. Uh, if we go to that chart, I'm using my PMO and the MACD did have that bearish crossover, but my PMO is actually starting to bottom and turn back up. But we are against some very severe overhead resistance right now for the healthcare select sector XLV the spider. With that, I will conclude our final market update. And let's go ahead and move into our scooter report. And I think I will go ahead and start, I guess, Tom, since I do have the floor here. Go right ahead. <laughs> okay. And we are going to do this on the fly. I think we, I think uh, both of us tend to do that. And I think it's a good exercise so you can see how you can go in and get your own personal scooter report and figure out the best ways to read uh, the scooters. I'm going to go ahead and look at our top 10 as far as scooters go. And here are the top 10, obviously, in the large cap space. And we can also look at what the big movers are today. And so I wanted to take a look at those top up movers. I'm going to pull it up in candle glance, which is my setup for looking at the PMO and a six month chart and just see if there's anything interesting here. Obviously, big breakout here for HDFC Bank. I'm going to look at this one just because of that uh, overhead resistance that was pretty much just uh, decisively broken here with a seven and a half percent move to the upside. I would watch this one for that pullback to that area that was previous overhead resistance. And I think this one has some, some pretty good opportunity to run. Notice the PMO uh, has been rising and we can see that we're getting readings above zero right now. And look at that nice move of the PMO. And of course there's that scooter move is, which brought us up to HDB. Let's go ahead and take another peek at some of these others. What might be interesting based on PMO and or chart pattern? Uh, I would say just looking at this right off. Okay, we're hitting some overhead resistance here, but we do have a PMO buy signal in play. I'm going to take this and annotate EQR. And here we go. And again, very important overhead resistance here. And it was actually being used as support at the end of 2017. <clears throat> so when I see a setup like this, uh, I'm very interested in if we can get that breakout. And according to the PMO, <clears throat> at this point, we have the PMO on a buy signal. So I think that one's pretty interesting. Uh, just a, a warning, I would say at this point would be the 50 is below the 200 day EMA. So it is in a bear market configuration as far as decision point is concerned, uh, but one to watch and see if we can get above that area of overhead resistance, because I think there's room to run here uh, at a minimum to $67 if we can get up above 64. So that would be one to watch. And let's see what else looks interesting here. So this one looks like we might've had a whipsaw going on here with the PMO. It's a bit on the overbought side. Uh, here's that move on the scooter that brought this to our attention. I'm not really impressed with this one. Uh, at this point, you know, obviously a big move to the upside. Uh, the PMO, while it is rising, we're now in overbought territory. So that would concern me a bit. And that was, let's see, next one I'm going to take a peek at that looks interesting. Let's see, Bear A G B A Y R Y. All right, another one that's just now coming up to that overhead resistance area. I'm going to go ahead and annotate this one as well. But I just wanted you to see how quickly you can go in and just get a, a, a pile of 10 stocks that you know are now starting to really increase relative strength 
And then we can go in and you can either add them to watch lists, but just knowing that relatively they're, they're looking stronger is a good thing. Now look right here, I can see it now. I didn't see it necessarily on the previous chart, but I, I have a, what I would call a, let's get this thick. I see a reverse head and shoulders here. It's a little bit, um, oh, what you, a little bit uh, complex, I guess, because of the way we've got this uh, left shoulder looking a little bit unusual. We got a fake out here. It didn't manage to get above, but it's trying again to get above. And if we execute this particular reverse head and shoulders, the height of the pattern, and here's a way you can do this quickly. Go over here to percentage price change. We're going to make this a color that we can see. So let's look at the length of the pattern. And then what I do is go in and see, click, select it. If I can, there we go. And then you can just hold down that uh, control key or command key, depending on what you're what you are using and then you can get just a copy of it. And then I just sit it right there. So look at that, our upside target here is right there, right on that overhead resistance that was at that uh, January top. Uh, and that's the minimum upside target. So another one to watch, uh, like I said, we got a, a whipsaw on this PMO, but it is a neutral territory. It's heading in the right direction. So one to keep in mind. And let's see. I'm going to take one more look. We're going to go back to uh, what we had before. Let's get rid of these. Let's go back to the member dashboard. And I'm going to look at some of the top down uh, ones. Michael Kors, we have been talking about this one for a while. Tom, what, did they have earnings or something that went on today? Because this is quite a move at 12.5%. Yeah, this is actually one that Mark Chaikin was talking about. And uh, I'm going <laughs> to let the cat out of the bag. I actually bought it. Oh, uh, today? Yeah, I just bought it uh, a little a little while ago um, because I, I did watch it from earnings. And of course, I keep track of the earnings very closely. And the earnings here were actually, actually pretty strong. Uh, they came in with earnings of 1.18 billion, or revenues, excuse me, revenues of 1.18 billion. The market was anticipating 1.15 billion. Their bottom line was 63 cents versus 60 expected, and they raised guidance. Hmm. So this is an indication, though, of how a company can have everything lined up beautifully for from a fundamental perspective. And then you look at the technicals and you're like, what the heck's happening? Now, I think this is a stock that's trading in a range. And what I'm counting on, and I could get stopped out pretty quickly, uh, what I'm counting on is that the lows from back in February are going to hold on cores. Uh, yeah. you've at the 200 day moving average coming up from underneath as well. But mm -hmm. what I really want to see is a reversal and a strong finish today on the stock. Absolutely. No, I think that this is one we've talked about for a while. It's been very strong and getting that pullback on relatively decent earnings, it sounds like this definitely uh, is an opportunity. Well, uh, so that, yep. As a, that's a lot of volume on the stock. So if it closes at the low, I'd be out. I would yeah. take but if it gets a reversal, it could be a pretty good opportunity. Yeah, I'd be watching that 200-day EMA very, very closely. But this is another uh, in, way you can go in and looking at these top down, uh, see what's been what's going on, and maybe uh, I know Mark was just talking about not bottom fishing, uh, but for those who do want to look at you know stocks that maybe were performing well but are relatively now moving down uh, on a bad day. Uh, this is an easy way to get to it. And again, I like to use that candle glance. It's just a quick way to get in there and see what's going on with these scooters. And, you know, I have it set up so that I have my PMO in there. And it, it's kind of a nice opportunity here. So I'm looking at these. These are actually in the top down. Um, but look at this, JD.com. Now it's lost some scooter points. It isn't performing that well relatively, but look, at we're right there on uh, support. I've got a PMO that is rising. Yeah, we're seeing a little deceleration, but on a move of almost uh, one and three quarters percent lower, uh, that obviously we're going to see the PMO get, see some deceleration, but it hasn't actually turned down here. 
so this might be one to, to consider, even though it is on that top down, you've got JD sitting here on that support level. I could, would even uh, venture a look in the weekly department here. And yep, there you go. So it's a pretty important support level here. Looks like we did break below it here at, at one point, but we're still holding on. We're still holding on there. So I'm, I'm not particularly fond of this weekly chart because you've got a giant double top sitting here after this nice move. And so if we did end up with that breakdown you know, further below that $36 level, uh, that that could spell uh, very bad news. But, you know, now we're looking at a possible uh, sell, sell short. So anyway, I just wanted to show everybody how you can use the member dashboard and get those candle glance scooter looks. And that can help you out as far as looking for either bottom fish or looking at those that are already relatively strong and continuing to improve in their relative strength. Okay, you uh, you got through all of yours? I got through mine, it's your turn. All right, well, I wanna take a look at it maybe from a little different approach. If you've been a uh, viewer, regular listener to the show, you've heard us do drilling down a uh, segment. So this is gonna be a combination of scooters and drilling down. Um, one of the areas of the market that I really like, talked about this on numerous occasions, actually talked about it earlier in the show, is the uh, healthcare providers. And if you look at a weekly chart on the DJUSHP, you'll see a huge uptrend in play. And really what we've been going through is an inverse head and shoulder, which I think is just, uh, we've just recently seen a breakout uh, back to the upside. So I'm gonna go back to this daily chart. Here was the breakout. We pulled back, we hit that rising 20 day moving average, and now we're quickly pushing right back up uh, on the verge of another breakout. So this is a group that I feel pretty good about that I, I'm comfortable trading. And so what I wanna find are stocks that look um, equally as impressive on an individual stock basis. So the way I would do this is going into the scooters. This is the area I wanna look at. Now, I've, I've spoken many times about the outperformance of the small caps with the dollar uh, absolutely exploding to the upside. So I'm gonna combine the healthcare providers and also the small caps to try to come up with some stocks that I like. So the way I would do this is going through, uh, let me back up, Going through that pro control center, you can see the scooter reports toward the bottom. You click on that. And then I know I want to go into the small caps, so I can change this from large caps to small caps. And then I'm going to type in healthcare providers. So now what this is going to give me are the healthcare providers, uh, the stocks within this industry group that we just looked at. And right now it's ranked by scooter rank. Now, some of them are, you know, you go down to this fifth one here, which is Addis Home Care Corp. It's only traded 35,000 shares. The next one's only 45,000. Here we've got one, uh, U.S. Physical Therapy, USPH, only traded 14,000. I know that this is a group that I want to look at. So the first thing I would do here is actually sort this by volume. So now I've got this group of healthcare providers, all small caps, and I sort it by the most volume down. So this is going to give me the ones that are most liquid at the top. So I think this is a pretty good list. Now, THC, scooters at 99 probably is going to be overbought just without even looking, but we pull up the chart and it's pretty overbought. It went sideways for a bit, but it's broken out. It's been up the last five days. Volume has been picking up. Look at the RSI. It's up over 80, 81. Great stock, but I'm not going to chase it. So I'm going to pass on THC. Let's take a look at some that I, that I really like here. And the first one is um, MOH. So this is Molina Healthcare down here. It's got a scooter 71. So it's, you know, kind of, there are some others that uh, maybe have done better on a relative basis, but I like Molina for a couple reasons. Number one, you can see the gap up at the end of April, huge gap up, very heavy volume. It did sell off, but the overall uptrend remained in play. So it consolidated. And I think now it's starting to turn back up to the upside again. Now this is the daily chart. I, I would recommend that you scroll out, take a look at that big picture. And when you look at Molina on this picture, I think it gives you a much better perspective of the uptrend that began back in March of 2017. You could connect these lows, and I think you got a really strong uptrend in play on Molina. What you're looking for is maybe a retest of that 93 to 94 area. Uh, a breakout above that on a closing basis would be very bullish. The next one that I would look at, if we go back on here, I can show you again, is PRAH. 
Now this one's only got a scooter of 53. So you might think, well, maybe this isn't one that I should be interested in because the scooter is only 53. But you, again, you look at the daily chart and you say, well, it's just sideways consolidating, really not doing much. But I noticed this gap up here, back above this downtrend line and with very heavy volume coming in the last two days. Uh, and you can see the pushes to the upside, a lot of interest in the stock. And so when I scrolled out and looked at the weekly chart, uh, it didn't look so bad after all. We got a nice long uptrend that's been in play for multiple years. And after getting overbought on a weekly basis, I mean, look at the RSI on a weekly basis. Back in January, it was in the upper 70s. We actually spent the last few months consolidating back to the 50-day moving average. And it looks to me on this chart like this short-term gap up the last two days is actually breaking this channel that we've been in to the downside to extend what has been a very solid uptrend. So I think PRAH looks great. Uh, a couple of others I'm just gonna go through very quickly. CYH, this is a stock I mentioned in my Monday setups. And also remember it had a big red candle and I said, watch to see if this stock reverses. I do own this, it reversed into the close yesterday, held on to support, and I'm now looking for a continuing move to the upside. Uh, RCM is uh, R1, RCM Inc. Uh, look at the pullback here recently, right back down to this price support level near $8. I think it's consolidating, unwinding overbought conditions. I look for another move up. And the last one I have is GEN, which is Genesis Healthcare. Big move up. Yesterday came down. This is a small company, only uh, $2.10 came down, hit the, not only the 20 day moving average, but also the breakout level. And look at the volume that came in on this push through the upside. These are the things that I'd be looking for, finding them within areas of the market that look like they are outperforming or on the verge of outperforming. So that's how I would use the scooter, combining it with some other strategies and themes and so forth. So let's take a, a look at a summary of what Aaron and I just discussed on this scooter report today. And uh, I know Aaron went through a number of different stocks, a number of different areas of the market. And my uh, focus really was just on the healthcare providers today. And uh, I think another area, maybe from a similar thought process that we could take a look at would be the biotechs. And maybe we'll try to do that in uh, another show here uh, uh, very soon. Cause I do think the biotechs are on the verge of potential breakout as well. Mm -hmm. So there's your list of stocks. Um, Another crazy day in the market, Aaron. Yeah. I mean, yesterday we had the big gap down and the huge selling. Today we get the big gap up. Now the Dow right now is up 325 points. Um, yeah. It's like yesterday never happened. Well, and you know, I, I wrote about it. I think I talked about it. I got a, a penetration of that lower Bollinger Band by the VIX on my ultra short term chart. And that told me to look for a rally pop today or tomorrow. And well, we got it today, so that's good. Very good indeed. All right, we got uh, upcoming announcements. Weekly schedule, yes. So tomorrow you're going to be doing a seasonality report to get us ready for June, which should be very interesting, which sectors, industries are doing the best. I will be doing the monthly decision point report. I will look at the monthly charts that will have just gone final. I have a workshop scheduled for Tuesday. I'm looking for subjects. So go ahead and put that in the survey responses. And finally, Charlie Kirkpatrick is going to be back with us. And I'm very excited to talk to him once again. And so now we're, we're all done. Sounds good. Yes. I want to thank everybody for being with us today. Uh, thanks to Mark Chaikin for stopping by as our guest. Uh, please remember to complete that survey as you exit. Uh, as a quick reminder, Market Watchers Live airs five days a week, Mondays through Fridays from noon to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Have a great Wednesday afternoon, everyone. See you back here tomorrow. Happy trading.